Hiya folks, once again, sorry for not making a lot of videos lately. I'm going to try to do as many as I can, but, but I'm hard at work on this book and it's kind of like, oh, I'm doing a lot of stuff on the book. So, the book is about Buddhist ethics and why Buddhist ethics are as they are, and trying to sort of explain them. And I've been corresponding with a guy named Tim Kwiatek. So, uh, he's a PhD student who has been helpfully telling me what Western ethics are so I can understand how it differs. And he sent me an email recently, and I'm going to assume he's okay with me reading it to you, it's not very personal, about his, uh, his take on why it's different. So let me read you what he says. The way I see it, there are at least two big disconnects between Buddhist ethics and Western ethics. The first is that Western ethics is based on the idea that the universe is a bunch of discrete objects, some of which matter morally and some of which don't. The things that matter morally are intrinsically valuable and worth protecting and promoting. Different moral theories will offer different stories about what it is that is essentially valuable in the world. Some say that at the end of the day, what matters is pleasure and pain. So I can't kick a dog because that would cause it pain, but it's fine to kick a stone because stones cannot feel pain. Other theories will prioritize something like autonomy or rational agency. So there are certain things you can't ever do to other rational creatures. If a tree is in your way on your property, you can cut it down. If a person is in your way, you can't cut them down. But whatever the story is about what makes some things valuable and some things not, it's a shared assumption among Western ethicists that some things matter and some things don't. And all our debates are about which ones are which and why. Someone like Dogen seems to flatly reject that assumption. And when he brought up that thing about a, a dog can feel pain but a stone can't, I immediately remembered this passage from Embracing Mind, Zen Talks of Kobenchino of Tagawa. And it's not addressing quite the same topic, but it is, you know, it's not aliens, but it is. I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. It's not addressing the same subject, but it sort of is. Here's what uh, Koben Chino says. And he's talking about pain in Zazen, but he gets into another subject, which is sort of interesting. We sometimes complain of pain in the legs, neck, or back, but know that pain is always there. You have just noticed it. It's not something you newly produced. Sometimes it shows up in other activities, such as when you walk on a steep hill. When you stop climbing a mountain, the pain goes away, but you know it is still there. Although we call it pain, it is simply a force which came along with our existence. Maybe in this force there is always pain, if there is a sense to feel it. When I touch my nyoi, which is a kind of stick that Zen people sometimes hold in their hands, I have one in the house somewhere, when I touch my nyoi to the floor, both my stick and the floor feel pain, but they don't say so. When a new life is born, the intensity of that force lets the mother feel pain along with incredible joy, which is another part of pain. If you just see the good or pleasant part of an activity and avoid the pain, or avoid piercing cold and suffocating heat, then you are limiting yourself, not letting the force go from one end to the other. Even with pain, what happens in sitting is that the scale of your sensations gets smaller and smaller until finally you feel that you come to a painless place, a very comfortable place, not hot, not cold, not high, not deep, about a middle place. Then you discover there is incredible pain in there. Not being able to get out of it causes a lot of pain again. Now the part that kind of resonates with the example he gave of the dog and the stone, you know, the dog feels pain and the stone doesn't, when I touch my nyoi stick to the floor, both my stick and the floor feel pain, but they don't say so. Now when you get into that sort of an idea, you realize, or I think you ought to realize, that we're talking about a very different worldview. And this is sort of the dilemma for me in trying to craft this book, because I don't want to just kind of lay out the Buddhist ethical system, which I've seen other books do, but I want to try to dig into why the Buddhist ethical system is the way it is. Because the Buddhist ethical system is very strict. And I did a talk at Angel City Zen Center, which I put up the audio for on this YouTube channel, if you want to go back a couple of weeks, about Dogen's Shoaku Makusa, which I rephrased as don't be a jerk in my book, Don't Be a Jerk. And I read a lot of that chapter and commented on it. 
And you get this impression, or I get this impression when I read this, that the Buddhist ethical system is really strict. Like there is no room for saying, well, I did this thing because, eh, you know, the kind of thing that a court of law in the West would excuse you for, the Buddhist ethical system does not excuse you for. It's saying cause and effect are absolute. So no matter what your valid reasons for doing this unethical uh, thing now in order to maybe produce a better result in the future, it doesn't work. You're, you're going to have the same karma whether you do that or not. So it's this very strict ethical system. And if you read Dogen, even things like how you wipe your butt are an ethical matter. But that one actually is fairly easy to explain, you know, especially in the midst of the pandemic and stuff. Because if you think about it, Dogen existed or lived uh, at a time before the germ theory ever existed. Nobody knew what a germ was or a virus was, but they had an idea uh, uh, they, from observation that clean people were both healthier themselves and uh, produced less disease among others uh, than dirty people. So it became a matter of ethics to keep oneself clean, which is why Dogen has a whole chapter on how to wipe your butt. I'm not making that up. There's an entire chapter on it. And I rewrote that chapter for my book, Don't Be a Jerk, if you want to read my version of it. But this is, a, this is an ethical issue, and everything is an ethical issue. The problem is if you try to explain Buddhist ethics in the terms of offered by Western ethics, you end up with something weird, or you end up making weird assumptions or coming to weird conclusions. Like you would think that if a Buddhist believes that even if touching a stick to the floor causes pain, then their ethics must be like so restrictive that they make them unable to do anything at all. And there was a commercial about uh, that, that sort of played on this idea a few years ago. It was for, I think, Kleenex or one of the tissue brands. And they'd come out with a new brand of tissue that had some antibacterial stuff in it so that every time you sneezed, you actually killed all sorts of bacteria. And the commercial had a guy dressed up as some, you know, ad person's idea of a Buddhist monk, and he sneezes into this tissue, and the voiceover is saying, this tissue kills, you know, 30,000 billion germs every time you use it. And the Buddhist monk looks horrified, like, oh my god, I've killed all these poor germs. You'd get the idea that all Buddhists are like that, but they're not. You know, a Buddhist will take antibiotics when he's sick. If, if a Buddhist gets COVID-19 he, and he's offered uh, antivirals or whatever they come out with next, uh, he's going to take it. He or she is going to take it. I guarantee you that they, they, uh, when Buddhists work on the garden, they pull out weeds. You know, they're killing all these poor weeds. Uh, they they cut lumber to, to make a temple. You know, it's... it's so So if you're trying to you know, read this Western idea of causing pain is wrong and therefore everything, if you cause everything pain and blah, 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 it just gets all twisted and weird. So this is my dilemma. <laughs> so I am not coming to a uh, conclusion in this video because I'm still working on how to frame this. But what I've seen so far is that you really cannot explain Buddhist ethics according to a Western system which divides everything into discrete objects and says that the worst thing you can do is cause pain to a sentient creature, which is, of course, the Buddhist attitude too. But then says everything is a sentient creature and then you just go crazy if you if you're trying to to do that so and that's not what we were doing so anyway wish me luck i may be able to write this book in a way that makes sense to people or it might just be one of these crazy books that nobody reads because it don't make any sense at all uh, i don't know which it's going to come out i don't know it'll be a while before it comes out because i'm still in the process of just compiling material so don't don't worry <laughs> it'll be out I'm, I'm sure COVID-19 will be long since cured by the time this book comes out. So that's, you know, that's the timeline we're looking on, but we're, we're working on it, or I'm working on it. And if you want to help me work on the book, uh, you can donate via PayPal and Patreon, and there's a link here which will show you uh, where to go to make that donation. And if you're watching on YouTube, the direct links to Patreon and PayPal are below the video. Which hand is which? One. This one goes like this. Okay, anyway, it's hard to figure out which hand is which when you're looking at this because it's not a mirror view. 
that's the deal please if you are strapped for cash don't send me any money because that's not what I want I don't want to be one of those TV preachers who's uh, asking you for money even when you don't have it everything is fairly copacetic with me so far and as long as things you know are on track I'll be okay but your donations are how I uh, live so that is important if you do have it so that's nice I thank you very much for those donations, and we'll see you next time that I make a video, and see you later. Bye.